Hey everyone, welcome again. Today we are talking about an exciting topic that is on a lot of parents' minds, if not most or all parents' minds, and that is what does school look like in the fall uh, here in the state of Utah? Uh, happy to be joined today by Mark Peterson, uh, who is the public relations director or spokesperson for the State Board of Education. Uh, Mark, thanks for joining us here. Hi, pleasure to be here. So maybe let's start with just kind of a, a high level question. Um, the State Board of Education has been very involved in figuring out what the fall looks like. Can you talk to us a little bit? What, what has that process been like over the past few months in preparation for reopening or not reopening schools in the fall? Uh, a lot of meetings with a lot of people um, because this goes beyond just education. We bring an education background to it but we also bring in teachers and principals and parents into the discussion to see how that's gonna work. And then we have to also work with um, the Department of Health, both the State Department of Health and local health departments to make sure we're, we're doing what's safe in, in reopening the schools. We don't employ epidemiologists or pediatricians or pulmonologists and the like. So we rely on the health department for that. And we rely on classroom teachers and principals and superintendents and our policy people to make sure that this is all legally right. So it, it, there has been a lot of work going on this summer. Talk to me about uh, the dynamic with having the state board versus the local boards. Does the state board have any decision-making power when it comes to all this, or is this the local boards making their own call with your guys' uh, input, or what does that situation look like? Well, the state board has some policy levers that it can pull. One of, one of the major ones that it pulled was on uh, July 23rd, when we approve some amendments to the pupil accounting rule that is going to make it easier for districts and charter schools to go back and forth between online and in-person instruction as needed throughout the year without jeopardizing state funding. Normally you have to offer 180 days of instruction and 990 hours of instruction within those 180 days we made some changes in there. The 180 days is still applicable, uh, but the 990 hours, we've made some amendments to it to allow so that if, if a school does have to go into to lockdown for um, COVID outbreak and they move to entirely online instruction, that schools don't feel obligated to, for instance, have third graders in a six hour long Zoom meeting every single day. Teachers can meet with them for a couple of hours, uh, provide some workbooks, some instructions to go on without jeopardizing their school funding. Uh, so, so that's uh, very helpful. It sounds like then the decision making power for whether to open or not open does reside with the local school boards, is that correct? That is correct, In and they should be working with their local departments of health. There's a wide range throughout Utah. Salt Lake City is still in orange. Uh, Daggett County, to my knowledge, uh, hasn't ever had a case of COVID. So, I mean, and everything in between, between those two extremes. The local school districts uh, have been doing a lot of polling in past weeks with uh, parents, teachers, trying to get a feel for, hey, do you want to come back to in-person instruction? Do you prefer online? Are you doing something else? Can you speak to that at all? Do you have your finger on the pulse of, of what uh, that type of polling looks like just in general around the state that these districts have been doing? Uh, I don't really have a feel for how the district polls have been going. However, I do know there was a new Hinkley poll uh, that came out either yesterday or it might have been in, even this morning that is roughly showing about half of parents are anxious to get their kids back to school in person and about a third of parents are not at all interested in having their kids back in school and about 20% are, I just don't know. And, and schools, uh, the school district and the charter schools are under a lot of pressure to 
accommodate all of those views. And, and it's a tough time to be a, a local school board member. Yeah, we'll post uh, a link to that uh, poll in the description uh, when we post this video. It was 54% uh, uh, of respondents or parents saying that they're going to send their children to school as usual. 23% uh, said that they're going to have them participate remotely. Uh, presumably, that then means still do the, the public school program and curriculum and so forth, but just at home learning. Um, Nine percent uh, said that they will homeschool and then 14 percent were unsure and, and presumably will follow maybe a similar breakdown once they have to finally decide uh, what they're going to do. So most people, a uh, slim majority, you're right, are comfortable going back to school. Uh, however, that's not without controversy, right? There's a, the teachers union has been pushing back, um, delayed openings, uh, you know, half time. There's been all sorts of proposals. Mm -hmm. um, is the school, is the state school board um, and, and your staff, is there concern that reopening schools is going to be met with uh, resistance by teachers or, hey, look, we'll open for a couple of weeks, but then we'll have to shut down if there's an outbreak? What is that dynamic like? Because there are very strong, passionate opinions right now from uh, teacher, many teachers who simply think that reopening schools is hasty and unsafe. Uh, understood, and and there are other staff members along the same lines that may not quite have the same voice. I know uh, bus drivers uh, have their own concerns, as do um, the, the uh, child nutrition staff, the school lunch and school breakfast people. So there's a, a whole gamut of people who have concerns for their own health as well as their family self, and I think it, it the teachers are not overly different from the parents and many teachers themselves are parents in that you're going to find a variety of um, opinion on that. I, I get calls from teachers who are wanting to know why they can't go back to the classroom and I get calls from teachers who say please you can't make me go back to the classroom and I empathize with both of those positions um, and again it's a tough time to be a local school board member. Uh, a lot of parents were foisted into this at-home learning thing when there was just the broad shutdown, um, you know, a few months ago. And uh, there's clearly a lot of concern among parents who maybe don't want to send their children back to school uh, for safety reasons, or they don't feel like they, you know, their children should have to wear a mask for hours a day or whatever their reasons mm -hmm. are yet these parents have to juggle their own jobs and their own life balance uh, to figure that out. Is it kind of an awkward thing to, in effect, deputize these parents to be like teaching assistants where they're having to monitor their children at home when they are en enrolled in public school, they're receiving public school instruction remotely. What is that gonna look like in the fall? A lot of parents right now, as we saw uh, in the poll, 23% participating uh, remotely uh, are those parents going to have more support than they did a few months ago? Is it going to be a materially different experience for the at-home public school instruction than we saw previously? I would certainly hope so. As we've been working with a variety of people to, to get schools open safely, we have also had our digital teaching people working with the districts and the districts working amongst themselves there was not much notice when schools closed down. If you weren't good at digital teaching, you got no time to get good at that. You've now had several months to get good at that. Most of the districts I know of um, had thought when this was over that it would kind of clear up in the summer as many of us did and, and things would look better. And they still plan to have digital days just to keep up teacher skills on that where they would uh, take a Friday and move digital and so kids could still come to school get breakfast or lunch but they would they would do their work online just to keep up both student and teacher skills in digital education so that is something schools have been working on and and we have examples of what worked well and what didn't work well and and consistency is kind of a key if you're particularly for the little kids if you are uh, having a Zoom meeting for the class, have it at the same time every day. So, and 
And with that, we're working with parents that the, their children will be up and have breakfast and brush their teeth and comb their hair and are ready for school at a certain time every day. And if, if you can develop that consistency, it tends to work a lot better. Digital natives in uh, high school years who were used to uh, not being anywhere without a phone or a laptop or an iPad um, are much better at working schedules to meet their needs. We saw, uh, I have a son who is a math teacher in, in ninth grade and he'd get assignments turned in at 11.30, 12.30, 1.30 in the morning because that's when they felt comfortable doing the work. So there are, there are some upsides to digital instruction, but there are downsides too. What do you anticipate the lasting impact is going to be of this? Let's imagine fast forward a year, COVID is you know resolved in whatever fashion that it is. Um, do you foresee kind of a, a lasting impact in how education is delivered or is all of this an effort in getting through it only to have things look uh, like they traditionally have on the other side? No, again, I, I think as the, as the districts have looked at this, I think there will be a greater reliance, not just in schools, but across the economic spectrum on distance learning and distance work. Um, for the most part, I mean, it has been bumpy. It has not been without its issues, but the United States as a whole uh, has gone very well from everybody goes to work, everybody goes to school, to most people work digitally and some people still go into work every day. And I, I see the digital piece of education doing nothing but growing at this point. The uh, polling we mentioned uh, had a, earlier had a question about uh, masks. The question uh, was, Governor Gary Herbert has made wearing a mask mandatory this fall in all public schools for faculty, administrators, and students. Do you agree with this decision? 62% said yes, 27% said no, 10% don't know. There's a lot of concern uh, about how masks will be enforced. Can you speak to what the dynamic is going to be? For example, if kids trade masks, right? Like, hey, yours is Pokemon and I like that one, let's trade. Or yeah, if yeah. Uh, rebellious- you know, Traders gonna come in with a great mask and everybody's gonna wanna try it on, right? Right, yeah, rebellious kids, you know, wearing it under their chin so that they're quote unquote wearing a mask but not covering it. Teachers, to my uh, understanding, uh, don't want to be mask enforcement officers Mm -hmm. um, and as kids are kids, if they see peers getting away with, you know, wearing the mask, but not wearing it properly, that's going to be an incentive for them to do it if they don't want to have that uh, fully covering them for hours on end. Has there been discussion about what enforcement looks like for masks because of the state health department's mandate on uh, K through 12 students and teachers and administrators? Uh, and I, I imagine that is going to look different depending upon what district or charter school you're in. And I, I think a large portion of that is going to actually have to be education and particularly if you have parents on board. So it's, it's heartening that of all the questions that were asked, that is the one that had the greatest majority. Uh, still, uh, still not an overwhelming majority, but still the majority of parents do support the mask. And if we can, it, it, humans and kids are social animals. And if, if you hit a tipping point where masks just become what everybody does, um, it's not, I don't foresee it being a problem. What's going to happen with enforcement, that's going to come down to how strict or tolerant or um, rather more loose with the rules an individual school teacher or principal is. Uh, I think you're right to note that the majority uh, of parents in the poll do favor masks. Uh, it, it should also be noted, of course, that that's the parents' opinion, that the children's opinion is a, an entirely different matter, right? And so 
uh, it remains to be seen what that compliance level will be like. And, and, uh, cause I don't think anyone wants to be, you know, disciplining children for not wearing a mask or giving them detention or suspending them or anything like that. But, uh, that is, you know, top of mind for a lot of parents who know that their children are going to struggle. Um, they want their kids to go back for the social aspects or they need them to go back for their own job uh, situation or whatever the case may be, but they know that their kids are going to have a hard time and what that, what's that uh, going to, uh, to be like. So it sounds like that is an open question and, and going to be diverse approaches based on each uh, individual uh, school. But there's no, to be clear, there's no top down directives that have been given or any type of statewide enforcement protocol of, of any sort? No, I mean, the, the health order is the health order and the State Board of Education can amend that. It's from the Department of Health and we just issued the order to the schools from the Department of Health and um, I'm sure we will be sharing best practices again on that, not unlike digital teaching. Um, and I'm sure there are going to be schools that come up with great plans that do that. And when they do, we will be sharing them with the other schools. Uh, historically in Utah, the percentage of children being homeschooled has hovered around 3%. Mm -hmm. uh, according to that same poll, 9% of parents have indicated that they're going to be homeschooling. What have the conversations been like with the State Board of Education with this? I mean, it's a substantial increase, tripling, if not potentially more as we get closer and parents have to make some hard decisions or, for example, if their children are not doing well um, in school or the parents aren't liking being that teacher's assistant as they were months ago mm -hmm. and they prefer to just go a different way and do their own thing. Um, how, how do we grapple, broadly speaking, when it comes to education when um, we're seeing such a strong increase in homeschooling? Uh, this is a new world for us. Homeschooling has, has always been, as you've noted, a, a fairly small piece of the pie in Utah. So this is, this is a new situation, and, and we have some districts, Davis District leaps to mind, we're very good at working with parents who are homeschooling. They will share uh, the um, instructional materials with them and go over some of the standards and this is what you should be teaching your kid this year. Other districts, none leaps to mind, but there are other districts that, that are not as keen to help parents who are homeschooling. They just, if they're homeschooling, that was the parent's decision and they should uh, handle that themselves. Uh, I, I tend to be more in favor of helping the homeschool parents as much as we can. The materials and aid for that would be with the school district though. So that's gonna be something um, that we would encourage um, districts to be uh, presuming this is, one generally does not file a, an affidavit for homeschooling with a charter school. So I'm assuming that's not going to come up much. But for the districts, it's something that, uh, particularly now with an expanded um, uh, base of homeschoolers, uh, we would encourage them to work with them to, to get, still get the best education we can for these kids. There are a few online only charter schools in Utah, and there's discussion right now about increasing the enrollment caps, uh, the limits placed upon them in terms of how many uh, children can participate. Uh, it, you talk about, you know, a much more heavier digital approach to education in the future. Do you anticipate, you know, that these types of online only schools um, that we're going to see more of them or those caps should be increased or waived so that any families who want to do that online first or online only approach have the ability to and aren't arbitrarily limited based on any of these types of caps? That would be very helpful. And, and again, uh, one of the online charter schools is run by the Washington School District. So this is something even the districts are uh, reaching out to, not, not just, um, not really outside charter schools, but charter schools that aren't linked with districts are working on it. So this is something a lot of people are working on. And I would suspect that this year we would have more interest in it. Uh, surprisingly this year, perhaps we are 
getting roughly the same number of teacher applications or teacher license applications as we've gotten in previous years. I, I didn't know whether that would go up or down, but it looks like it is actually staying about even. So there, there are still more teachers coming into the system. Uh, we've processed um, something like 700 new licenses so far, and we have a few hundred more to go. So there are new teachers coming into the system. So there are some new resources out there too. Uh, on the teacher question really quick, I uh, saw an article about a week about Alpine school districts struggling to hire substitute teachers. And that's obviously a more short-term acute uh, situation. Do you have any handle on, on a more statewide uh, perspective on the substitute teacher shortage and what that's going to look like for the next few months? Well, I would suspect um, with a statistical background that reality is lumpy. Um, in that there are going to be districts where they're going to struggle to find enough substitutes. Alpine uh, and Jordan being in high growth areas with a lot of students are going to have trouble doing it. A, a, a very rural district like Rich probably has an infrastructure in that they've had for years because it's small and it's rural. Uh, and I suspect that's going to be a district by district case or charter school by charter school case. Um, and uh, state actually gives maximum flexibility to the districts and charters on that. And that um, our requirements are a bachelor's degree and a background check. Now, some districts will also require an actual license to be a substitute teacher but it's not a statewide requirement because we also understand that if you're in uh, Richfield, that's going to be a lot harder to come by a licensed teacher who isn't already working full-time. That makes sense. Mark, you mentioned earlier the uh, change made by the board, the levers that it could pull, uh, one of them being uh, the change to how kind of the finances flow in terms of how instruction has to be given, certain number of hours and so forth. Um, one of the hard things that parents are facing right now are the financial realities of education as it comes to their own children. Uh, even for those who are doing remote instruction uh, at home with their children, they have to change their life and their job situation perhaps to be able to accommodate having that child at home. Uh, certainly the rise of homeschooling parents, it's more acute where they're not benefiting from the instruction being given directly by the system. A lot of parents are uh, participating in like MyTag High and Harmony, uh, which provide funding directly to uh, the families. There's obviously a lot of uh, concern, at least in years past, there has been by the board and some legislators about how those systems work and uh, if they should uh, continue. Has there been a discussion by the board about the, the financial um, aspects of home education? Are we going to have to have uh, some different discussions in the future because of the distance learning and the remote learning if we're not utilizing those services, whether the teacher uh, or the facilities? Um, there's going to be this more maybe blended approach of people who either fully homeschool or pick something in the middle. Um, there's a lot of demand from families who feel like if I'm paying taxes for a system I'm no longer utilizing for X, Y, or Z reasons, should I not be able to uh, keep some portion of my income tax which goes to education or have some other things? Several states are looking at uh, this uh, uh, or even making movements in that direction uh, in weeks past. What does that look like in the future and what type of conversations do we need to be having when it comes to that uh, funding? Well, I suspect that will be something the board takes a look at. Again, the, the administrative rule that they uh, adjusted for this year, the, the pupil accounting rule, um, is one that they adjusted just for this year, anticipating that there's going to need to be discussion on that in following years. So, it, it, I mean, it's only a one-year uh, fix for the pupil accounting. It's for this year. Following that, there will be further discussions with it. Um, what that's going to look like, I couldn't tell you. We will have new board members in January. Um, and this is 
for the first time, the board is moving to a partisan race. So we will have eight board members who will be either Republicans or Democrats who will join for the next two years, seven nonpartisan candidates who still are sitting on the board before it becomes fully partisan. So that, I don't know how that dynamic is gonna change the discussion, but it's a discussion that's gonna to have to be had for the moment, the crisis of the moment has overwhelmed the discussion of finance, but that is certainly a discussion that the board sees coming. Yeah, from a, a statewide perspective, it, it makes sense to, uh, the, as you say, the crisis of the moment overwhelming the broader discussion for a lot of families. It's a, it's a very real uh, uh, situation that they're having to confront where they feel that this is best for my child, and yet it creates these uh, predicaments, uh, mm -hmm. I'll call them, or challenges um, that they have to grapple with. So I, I think you're right. That will certainly be a discussion going forward, and there will be a lot of interested parties when it comes to that. Uh, final question as we wrap up here, uh, just the uncertainty involved, uh, right? Parents have been waiting to see what these rollout plans are going to look like, and districts are doing things differently, and who knows if any of this will stick, right? Maybe the mask mandate goes away a month in when everyone sees that mm -hmm. it's just not enforceable, or who knows what. What message would you or the, the board give to uh, parents who are kind of they would they might say treading water amid all this uncertainty when it comes to education what's the message to to say to them focus on education the the key is what you want for your child and what your child's teacher wants are probably in alignment you if you will focus on what's best for getting the education your child needs whether that's a first grader or a seventh grader or a high school senior, focus on those needs and what, what your child needs to, to get through. If you'll focus on that rather than all the white noise around you and trying to discern how best to go about this. Um, I, I, I put in a funding request for a magic eight ball to, so that I could see the future, but funding hasn't come through on that. And so much of what we have to do now is respond to the dynamics of the situation. I wish it weren't so, uh, and, and someday we will have enough breathing room to create a strategic plan looking forward and take into account all of the new dynamics available uh, in distance learning that we didn't have 10 or 15 years ago that we've got now. There are a lot of new tools that got tested very hard, very fast with a lot of people. Some of them are working great. Some of them aren't Zoom meetings. We found you had to be a lot more careful about who found out invitations to them or you got bombed and, and hit with inappropriate materials. But it's also made it better and we're meeting here on Zoom now and, and having a great conversation and not being bombed. So things are improving and you're just going to have to give yourself permission to respond to the situation and just keep the North Star being your child's education. Mark Peterson is Public Relations Director for the Utah State Board of Education uh, here to impart some Wisdom amid all the uncertainty, uh, clearly a lot of uh, hard decisions to make and a fluid environment in which to make them in the weeks and months ahead for parents. So Mark, just uh, appreciate you taking the time to, to share your thoughts here with us. Very happy to be here, thank you.